إن أرادتم أن تكونوا شامة بين الورى فاختفوا آثار جيل للمعالي سطرا إن أرادتم أن تكونوا شامة بين الورى فاختفوا آثار جيل للمعالي سطرا جيل زيد وأوسيد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين به ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله تعالى من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مذل له ومن يذل فلا هدي له أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا وحبيبنا وأسوتنا وقائدنا محمد عبده ورسوله اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى كل من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما سبحانك اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وبعد All praises for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <clears throat> and we show gratitude for granting us today the ability to be here uh, I also thank the ISOC here the organizers and all of you for coming for inviting me <clears throat> I actually came here I think just last year or the year before I can't remember but it was a different lecture theater um, so it's good to come Alhamdulillah to Sheffield I think that's the only time I come to Sheffield when it's like a university. There's nothing else to come for. <laughs> um, you know, when I was a kid, when I was young, the way we used to identify Sheffield was with those big, massive things on M1. They've taken them out now. What were they called? Some tower. What, what towers? They were cooling towers. Cooling towers. So, all my life, when we used to go up north, we always used to go past those two massive towers, smoke coming out of them, and that's it, Sheffield. Every time we see, see those towers, we think of Sheffield. And then later on, it's that green dome that we see, which some people mistake for the message of the Messenger of Allah. But there is a massive difference between that and what, what's. Which green dome are you referring to? Which green dome? I'm sure people have understood. The meadow hall green dome. Right. <laughs> but anyway, I think that's a good starting point, talking about the, that dome, if you can call it a dome. And uh, this topic that we have today is life just a game. <clears throat> when I realized that this was a title, I spoke to the brother. Muhammad Yusuf, I think last week, and I just realized there were two Yusufs in the car, and I was thinking that I was speaking to the same brother, but I asked him, because he told me the title, and the email came that the title is, Life Just a Game. So I said, what do you want me to talk about? Because this is a question, is life just a game? The answer is actually, it depends on how you look at this. And this is why I was confused slightly as to what aspect the organizers want me to talk about. If I ask somebody here the answer to this question, is life just a game? Anybody, put your hand up. One. Brother there at the back. I'm looking at you, don't turn your face. You. Yes, you. Is life just a game? What would you, how would you respond? I'm asking you. Yes. <laughs> you wouldn't say it's a game. Correct. Anyone else with a different answer? The Quran tells us there is a literal trans. There's a verse in the Quran. The literal translation of that, Allah says, "Wama al-hayat al-dunya illa la'ibun wa la." The worldly life is nothing but a game and amusement. This is, and there's no, 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 uh, numerous verses like that. This is in Surah Al-An'am. وَمَا هَذِي الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَهُ وَالْعِيْبُ إِنَّمَا هَذِي الْحَيَاةُ فِعْلَمُونَ 
اعلموا أن ما الحياة الدنيا لعب ولا let it be known that this worldly life is fun, amusement and game so by looking at those verses and that's what I thought first that you want me to talk about is this life a game, the Quranic verses all these verses came to my mind that yes there's numerous texts and verses in the Quran that tell us that life is a game it's an amusement, it's a play it's fun but then he said to me no, we're looking at it from another angle which is is life just a joke or should we take this precious life that Allah has blessed all of us with time which is a precious asset is it just joke fun, do we just spend it like how we want to and that is also true so the answer to this question is life just a game it depends on how we look at this question in relation to the akhirah in relation to the next life in comparison to the hereafter life is nothing but a game this is a trivial 60 70 years that we spend this is why allah says in the quran that the real life is that the next life, the coming life, is the real life if only they knew. So, in relation to the next life, this life is a game. And I want to ask, uh, cover, uh, you know, touch upon or uh, cover both aspects. And that's why both topics I want to sort of cover, inshallah. So this life in relation to, like we say nisbatan, in relation to the next life is nothing but a game. It's a trivial life that we have. And this is why it's a deception. Human beings can be deceived by this worldly <coughs> temporary life. And this is why Allah says in another place in the Quran that this world and this life is mata'ul ghurur. It's a means of deception. Humanity and human beings are in deception. We feel and we think that this is the eternal life and everything just revolves around this life. We think this is the only life. Even though we believe, some, some people don't believe in the next life. And even those who believe, and alhamdulillah most of us believe here, but even those who believe in the next life and believe in the life after death, we are so engrossed, and this is part of our nature, we are so engrossed in our worldly, this worldly activities and because this world is tangible, we are living it right now, it is very difficult to think about the next life. Dunya, the word in Arabic for this world is dunya. Dunya actually means near. One of the meanings of dunya is near. Another meaning is something that's not that important. It's degraded. But the, one of the main meanings of the word dunya in Arabic, which has been used in the Quran and many sacred texts to describe this world, is something that which is near. And the next life is known as? As? Akhira. Akhira means next. The coming one, later one. We as human beings, our nature is such that that which is right in front of us right now, we take that to be everything. And we do that even in our life, this life itself. We do that in the life itself as well. We deal with the present as though this present is the only important thing in our, in, for us. This is why in one hadith, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, اِعْمَلْ لِدُنْيَاكَ بِقَدْرِ بَقَائِكَ فِيهَا وَعْمَلْ لِآخِرَتِكَ بِقَدْرِ بَقَائِكَ فِيهَا Live and do and work for this world as long as you're going to live in this world. And work for your next life as long as you're going to live in the next life. Next life is eternal. It is the belief of the believers that the next life is eternal. And in comparison to this life, this life is 60, 70 years maximum or 80. 60, 70 years in comparison to an eternal life. So, this point, first of all, we need to really focus on. That there are many verses in the Quran, and I mentioned some, but I'll just mention them again just properly. There are many verses in the Quran that describe <coughs> this dunya, this world, this worldly, earthly life to be nothing but just an amusement, a play, it's a joke, in comparison to the next life. The verse in Surah Al-An'am, Allah says, وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ I, I translated that, literal translation, this worldly life is nothing but لَعِب لَعِب means a game. مُلَاعَبَ لَعِب مُلَاعِب is a player. Right? So, لَعِب, it's nothing but a, a game. وَلَهُ and it's amusement. وَلَدَارُ الْآخِرَةِ 
خَيْرُ لِلَّذِينِ يَتَقُونَ And the next coming life is better. It's, it's a better life and it's more important for those who fear God. Those who fear Allah. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Allah says, don't you think, don't you reflect, don't you ponder over this fact? That this is a very short life. Now the, now the, there's another verse in Surah Al-Ankabut where Allah says, إِنَّمَا الْحَيَاةُ دُنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَهُ وَمَا هَذِهِ الْحَيَاةُ دُنْيَا إِلَّا لَهُ وَلَعِبٌ وَإِنَّ دَارَ الْآخِرَةُ لَهِيَ الْحَيَوَانِ لَوْ كَانُوا يَعْلَمُونَ I've already mentioned that verse, that the real life is the next life, if only they knew. There's another verse in Surah Al-Jum'ah where Allah says, قُلْ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ خَيْرٌ, خير مِنَ اللَّهُ وَمِنَ التِّجَارَةِ وَاللَّهُ خَيْرُ الرَّاسِقِينَ Say your messenger, say to the people, that which is by Allah in the next life, whatever is going to be given in the next life, paradise and the bliss and the pleasures and the bounties and the gifts and the rewards given by God in the next life, that is much better than the amusement and the play and the joke of this life. And the business and the transactions and the money making and the gathering of wealth of this life. The next life is much better. And finally, this verse is very important. SubhanAllah, this is such an important verse in Surah Al Hadid. You know Surah Al Hadid? Hadid means the ayah. Surah Al Hadid is a very famous surah. In it, there is a very important verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says, I'lamu annama al hayatu dunya la'ibu wa lahun. وَزِينَةٌ وَتَفَاخُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ And then Allah gives an example. كَمَثَرِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُ ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرًا ثُمَّ يَكُونُ حُطَامًا What does Allah say? اِعْلَمُوا Know, recognize. He's talking to me and you. Talking to all of us. Recognize and know. أَنَّمَ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا لَعِبٌ وَلَا same message. There are numerous. I've just quoted like four verses. These are just four verses. There's a, quite a few, many other verses giving the same message. But the same sort of, you know, uh, message. No, this haya, this life is la'ibun, it's game, and it's amusement. And then Allah mentioned some other things. He said it's a game, it's a play, it's an amusement. Wazinatun. And it's a means of people just adorning themselves. And what a بَيْنَكُمْ And this life is about just um, being boasting amongst one another with your worldly possessions. وَتَكَاثُرٌ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ And it's about, this life is about competition in wealth and in children. So Allah said it's a la'ib, game, amusement, adornment, boasting and competition. And then Allah gives an example. كَمَثَلِ غَيْثٍ أَعْجَبَ الْكُفَّارَ نَبَاتُهُ ثُمَّ يَهِيجُ فَتَرَاهُ مُصْفَرَّ That this, it's like a rain. This life is like a rain. Where the rain grows, the, uh, the agricultural produce is it, produced. And this uh, attracts the farmers. They, they become very happy. When the rain falls, they become very happy. Because they're seeing a lot of produce. The farmers become happy, but then it starts withering. And then Allah says, مصفرة, And then you see it becoming, turning yellow. مصفرة, and then it just becomes like a straw. This is what this life is about. It looks good in the beginning, and it's, when it ends, it's nothing. It's just like a straw. There's nothing there. Now this ayah is actually quite significant, something very important. And this actually, I actually read about this just yesterday, but before that, I actually thought about this in my own mind, I read this from another scholar, but I thought about this in my own mind and I wrote about it somewhere a few months ago. But we should really sometimes reflect on, this is what this ayah is trying to tell us and to reflect, but we should reflect upon this worldly life. Occasionally, not every day, okay, dunya, we shouldn't be gloomy that, okay, yes, uh, I'm gonna die, I'm going to die. Every person you, you meet, you're gonna die, you might die anytime, you can't, you might just get out from there, you're gonna die, you're gonna die. It's not like that. But occasionally, every so often, we are duty bound. We should always keep our focus on the next life. What really matters is the next life. We'll live in this world, and I'm going to talk about that. But what this ayah is telling us, that reflect. It is important to occasionally reflect on the nature of the dunya. The nature of this life. This life is a combination of levels and stages every single one of us right every single one of us we go through certain stages of our life every single one 
And the funny part is that at every stage we feel subconsciously we think that this is the most important part. This is the most important thing in, in the world or for anyone. Everyone else is not in the abnormal, uh, they're not in the normal default sort of situation. At every level. When you move from that level and you move, you ascend to a next level, you think about your previous level as though it was childish. People laugh at their previous years. You know when you went right now, you think about when you were five years and you did something, so oh, I did that, and it's crazy, you laugh at yourself. But what you're doing now, when you're the next 20 years, you're gonna laugh at what you're doing today. This is, this is the nature of this life. We all go through each stage, different uh, these stages. So this ayah is saying that, look, when you're a young child, dunya is about la'ib. There's a difference between la'ib and lahu. Allah used two words. Life is game and then amusement. The difference between la'ib and lahu is, la'ib is like that sort of a game or that sort of amusement which has no sort of, um, there's no benefit whatsoever. There's no like winning or losing, like a toy. So when a child is a toddler, when there's a child, he's a toddler. This is the first stage, okay? And at that stage, the whole world for that toddler, for that child, revolves around what? Toys, cars, small cars. You talk to him about dentistry, medicine, what's that? Probably some jinns do that, right? So some supernatural beings and living in space study at a university. What is a university? But that child, at that time, when that child is four years old, really thinks this is the most, you know, this is the most important thing for any anyone. I mean, these people are you know, big, big people. They're like giants, supernatural, you know, giants. I don't know. They're from some different species. My parents are different species. Child, everything. You snatch the toy away from the child. What happens? The child thinks he's lost every part of his possession. Everything's gone. The child thinks that's it. The whole world. For that child, toddler revolves around toys and those games that have no, even the games themselves are of like no, you know, benefit like winning or losing or anything. So, this is the first stage, la'id. Then Allah says, lahu. The child grows up a bit, gets to a level of being a teenager. When a person reaches to that second stage of being a teenager, then what's important? La. La'ib has now turned into lahu. Lahu means games and amusement. Those now forms of entertainment that have some sort of benefit. Now the, the young teenager wants to pay, play games on the computer, the latest gadget. iPhones. You know, all the, all the well, now the toddlers play with iPhones as well. Apps. But um, this is the next stage, right? Uh, the latest technology. The child wants an iPad and wants to play all the games on the iPad, etc., etc., etc. And it's a stage where that teenager, you're growing up, you think that child, uh, that teenager, really seriously thinks at that time that this is the most important stage. People in their twenties and thirties, some older people, they just think they're too, you know, clever. Right? They don't understand, you know, what we need to do. And young children, four, five year olds, they just think, you know, these are kids, they call us crying. You know, right now it's about friends and it's about, you know, social media, how many friends you have on Facebook. And nowadays children, you know, teenagers are on Twitter and I don't know where else they're, they're at. So at that time, this is the stage. Okay? Uh, and at the stage of love, that child thinks about, that teenager, sorry, if you thinking about the previous stage, the first stage, what was that? The stage of no. being a toddler. If you give that 14-year-old teenager a small toy to play, what will that teenager say? Hey, give me this. What am I going to do with this? Doesn't want a toy anymore. Because that teenager has moved from la'i to lahu, to the stage number two. But this is significant to re keep in mind that at every stage we think this is the most important stage and all other stages, people in, at other stages of life, they're like, you know, they're just not really important. Okay? Then we move on to 
And, and at that stage, you think about parents and they're too strict and they're backwards and they don't understand us. You know, when the, when the parents say, don't waste your time on, on the iPhone. They don't really understand, you know, this is important. He's not from back home, or I don't know where the parents have come from. But when you grow, when you become a parent, you think the same, you'll become the same like your parents were when, uh, when you were young. So when we move on to the third stage, which is Allah has described with zina. اعلموا انما الحياه الدنيا لعب ولهو then Allah says وزينة adornment now the stage is of adornment fashion clothes a nice car with aloe wheels sports car right because now you've passed your driving test now you're 19 20 so now you want a nice car it's all about showing off your car on I don't know if you have those roads here, like in Manchester, you have Munzra Road and, uh, you know, you have those roads. Yeah, you know Munzra Road, probably you guys go to Manchester. If you go on Munzra Road on Friday night, Saturday night, all these teenagers and blasting music and going fast. When, when, when we look at that, I mean, I've gone past that stage, you think about it, it's wasted, it's just, you just feel like it's just so childish. And maybe when I was, not maybe, I think I was, when I was 19, I probably did the same thing, a bit just a bit, you know, with the friends driving in the car, it just feel good, you know driving a nice car. But now when you think about it, you just think, yeah, it's a bit childish. So that's Zina. All the latest fashion. The, the sisters want to be size, I don't know, whatever size. And the latest fashion and the latest makeup and the latest this, and just to impress and you just... When we are young, there was no Zina. Clothes were dirty playing outside when you're seven, eight years old. Who cares about how the clothes are, clean or dirty? But we're thinking about our game. When we are in the stage of zina, adornment, stage number three, then even if we were to play a game, we would ensure that our clothes are clean or we'll change and then we'll change back to our clothing. We'll make sure there's no, you know, crease in the clothing, etc., etc. And then we move on to another stage. The zina also moves on to another stage, stage number four of our life, which most of you are probably at right now which is the stage or the level where you start thinking in your early 20s about careers, about degrees, about jobs, and then marriage. And you think that this is the most important thing in any human being's life. It's about, you know, career, about student fees, about jobs. It's about dentistry, about being a medic, about, you know, marriage. You think, that when you look at the toddlers, well, they're just toddlers anyway, you look at the teenagers, we weren't like this when we were young. These people are so bad in this day and age. When we were young, we had some sort of moral ethics. You know, the world has changed. They were, these, these kids, this, nowadays, astaghfirullah, we weren't like that. And we look at the elders, conflict between parents and, you know, youngsters about marriage. They don't understand what kind of girl I want to get married to. And they don't really understand you know, going back home, I'm not saying it's what is right and wrong parents, I and mean, that's another topic, but it's just, hence the conflict between parents and children. Because parents are looking, they, their brain has moved on to another stage, and the youngster at the university, his stage is somewhere else. So there's a conflict in marriage issues, but it's all about degrees, etc. And then you get to another stage, which is stage number five. You've already found your life partner, and you're already married. And now you have, you've become a parent. When you become a parent, the most important role for any human being is to be a good parent. Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters in the world. Especially when you have, have newly born children. The most important thing in life, the most difficult task, the most difficult job, the greatest responsibility on planet Earth is to be a good parent. That's it. Nothing else matters. Right? So that's another stage. And then we think as well, you know, uh, that being parents is very important. You tell the children, look, when you have small children, you'll understand and you start advising people who are younger than you. And then we carry on, we get to the middle age, which is stage number six. When we get to the middle stage, where now we've got our careers, jobs, and young children growing up, you know, in your mid thirties or whatever. Yeah? People sometimes don't marry to, to that age, but normally, generally mid-30s, late-30s, 40-ish, around that time, then you get to a level of uh, where you think, that's it, I'm all powerful. You probably bought your first home as well now, 
right? I know it's very difficult to be staged to buy homes, but people kind of buy at that time. Uh, so you bought your home, you've got a few toddlers, small children. It's all about power. Probably that's the most powerful stage of the human humanity, the stages of humanity. Because on one side you have elderly parents, they're weak and feeble, so you're looking after them. They depend on you. On the other hand, you have young children, they're weak and feeble and dependent. They depend upon you. So we feel very independent. Everyone depends on us. My children depend on me. My parents depend on me. I am the most powerful human being on planet Earth. This is where you start thinking about wealth, about you know properties, about investment, and that's it. You know, you just in a different sort of complete different sort of stage where nothing else matters. Children, these are really bad. You know, in our time, you know, we were like this. These are children are wasting time. Look, look at the, look at the state of the children and youngsters today. And the old ones, oh, they're just going to die anyway. They're half, you know, in the grave as it is. This is the most important stage, and this is Allah mentions this in the Quran that Allah starts you with da'af, and then you go to quwa, then you go back to da'af. خَلَقُكُمْ مِنْ ضَعْفٍ مِنْ بَعْدِ قُوَّةٍ وَشَيْبَ Allah talks about this, that you start with weakness, and then you get power, and then after power you get back to weakness. You start, you end where you started at. And that's why it's like going uphill, and then you go back downhill. It's like, you know, you know those, uh, if you've been to some of these parks, um, um, theme parks, you know what a log flume is? Yeah. It's like life is like a log field. You go slowly, slowly, especially the first half seems very slow because you are moving rapid, you are moving through different stages. So you slowly, 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 you're getting up. And then you're in the center, mid 30s or whatever. And then the second half is very fast. It's like a dip, down, straight, end of life. So when you are 30, you are 30. When you are 31, you are 29, 28, 32 is 28. That's how you count, you're going back because average nowadays is 60. It's very fast. Before we realize one stage to the next stage and it's end of time. Seriously, we have to think, every one of us, myself included, we have to keep reflecting upon this. Because you know, every one of us, when, when, you know when you see an old man out there, or an old woman walking there, maybe disabled, it's just sometimes, subconsciously, we think they're different. They're not different. That's us. That's me, you, in just a few years' time. When they were my age and your age, exactly that's what they thought. They thought exactly the same. They also went, through, you know, went to university. They also had a career. They also had all these aspirations. But now they're on crutches and they're disabled. They're in the home, whatever. It's just gone fast. You talk to them as well. And they realize you know, how fast it's gone. So that's the middle age stage. And then you just, it doesn't end there. Then it's stage number seven. That's stage number seven and stage number eight. And actually there was one stage right at the beginning, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention that afterwards. Stage number seven is when we become very old in our 60s now. And feeble. Again, what do we think? We think We've got all the experience of the world. We are very experienced. Young people talk to, to us. Even if they make sense, they're very intelligent, we don't want to listen to them. We don't want to give importance to them. You guys, kids, youngsters, you don't know what dunya is. You haven't lived in this world. You must have heard some old people saying that. Don't worry. That's their right to say that because we'll say the same to you know, people younger than us. You know, when I used to, I said to some of my friends, I said, before there was a time when I used to meet a lot of people, Every time I used to meet people in like friend circles or like, for example, lectures. Yeah, I said lectures. Because I travel a lot and, and sometimes when we have lectures, programs, conferences, we have other speakers, other shaykhs and imams and scholars, whatever. Especially in different parts, uh, in different countries where you have conferences and when they invite like 19 people. So before, like just six, seven years ago, every time I used to be there, I used to always find speakers. A lot of them, like most of them when I started first, most of them were older than me. And then it moved on to like people very close to my age, and now I'm just meeting lots of people who are like much younger than me. If there's a speaker list of ten people, but six are younger than me, and that just makes me think that yes, I am getting old. These are small, small things that should remind us about our life. So when we get really old, this is what Allah said: after zina, what tafakhur? Well, sorry, this middle age was tafakhur. Tafakhurum baynakum. 
boasting with wealth, you're powerful. This is my degree, this is my career, this is my job, this is my firm, this is me, that's the fakhr, that's the middle age. Okay? And then what did Allah say after that? وَتَكَاثُرٌ بَيْنَكُمْ فِي الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ And then this competition in increase of wealth and children. Children, there was a time when people used to what? Uh, have competition and boast in, terms, in regards to the children, not anymore. Right? But now, the boasting or the, or the competition is about my child has this degree and my child has this position and my child has uh, been given this status. So that's what the boasting is about. So in old age, when, you know, this is what we do, we, we boast or towards the old age. And when we become very ill and weak, uh, then, you know, the most important thing for a really old person is what? My well-being. Nothing matters. You know, when you talk to an old person, you talk to him about there's a massive earthquake which killed 400,000 people. I don't know if it kills that many people, but it killed in another country. But you say, oh my, this leg, you know, it's, it's so small, and you know, I didn't eat last, I didn't sleep. You tell him, oh, there was a massive, you know, something happened, all these people, plane crashed and someone died, all these people died. Oh yeah, and then I talk about his foot, okay? <laughs> because nothing matters for that old man. And that's us, yeah? That's us in a few years' time, brothers and sisters. So, and kids become a nuisance. An old man or an old woman, kids are a nuisance. You get a headache very easily. Even the children are just playing or just talking. You don't want disturbance because you're at that stage. And like I said, at every stage we think that this is the most important stage. And when we look at the previous stage, we think, we, we, we laugh at ourselves and we think we were fools for giving so much importance to the previous stage. When we are at uh, stage number five, we think about stage number four and three, was that really me? Did I really, did I really do this? You know, and that's all of us. And this is what Allah is saying in these few verses. And finally, when you leave this world, and that's the final stage, that's not mentioned in the verse, but when we leave this world, when the eyes close, when the eyes close and we go to the next life, Akhira, then the whole worldly life, stage one to stage seven or eight, all the stages will seem like just foolishness and game and play. This is what Allah is saying. It's like a dream. It's like a dream. You know, sometimes we have a dream and in the dream we're like, you know, really happy. You wanted to marry a sister and you're married in the dream. And then you wake up in the morning. Oh, no, 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 I'm not married until I'm in bed by myself. <laughs> or you wanted this car, you're driving a you know, Lamborghini or something. And then you wake up and you go outside your house and you still got your golf or whatever you've got. And likewise, if someone's swearing at you, slandering, or someone's scaring you, or there's an animal there just about to attack you in your dream. And what happens? You can really, you actually feel Feel it. It's like real in the dream. And you wake up. Phew. That was just a dream. When we go in the next life, then we'll find out, we'll think, dunya was just a dream. It's just one stage to the next stage to the third stage. It just went so fast. It went so fast. And Allah says this in another verse in the Quran. كَأَنَّهُمْ يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَهَا لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً أَوْ ضُحَاهَا when humanity, when human beings, when they will go in the next life, on the day when they will see Akhirah, يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَهَا لَمْ يَلْبَثُوا إِلَّا عَشِيَّةً أَوْ ضُحَاهَا They will think to themselves, when they will see the next life, they will think that they never stayed in the world, dunya, except for a moment in the morning or a moment in the evening. عَشِيَّةً أَوْ ضُحَاهَا It was just a moment. And I normally give an example of this. It's like, you know, to understand this verse, an example. Picture this uh, scenario. How long is the next life? Eternal. Eternal. Eternal means what? It means eternal. Eternal means eternal. 600,000 years? More than that. So imagine in the next life, in Jannah or in paradise, inshallah, where all of us will be, I mean, 
Imagine these two brothers down there. I'm going to click on YouTube today. These two brothers here, they both, he had a massive, nice mansion, castle in Jannah, and he had his mansion. And he came out of his mansion, and he came out and said, Assalamu alaikum, brother, how are you? How's, how's, what's happening? How's everything? It's okay. Come on, let's go and have some coffee and some shisha as well. Yeah. Like I always say, in Jannah, it'll definitely be halal. <laughs> but in this world, I don't know. I'm not going to answer it here. But anyway, in Jannah, it's halal. That's, I know that. Someone asked me, shisha halal? I'll say, yeah. In Jannah, it's halal. <laughs> Wait till Jannah. So, in paradise, you come out from your castle and you go to this shisha cafe or whatever uh, and you start having your coffee and you start discussing and talking and you start talking about it. So, do you remember? And this happens, imagine after 600 million years. You've lived for 600 million years in Jannah and after 600 million years, one day you, you know, popped out from your castle, you came out and you thought, let's... And you start talking about dunya. Brother, do you remember? What? Do you know there was a place called Dunya? When was that? Oh yeah, long, 600 million years ago. Do you remember, um, we used to, yeah, I think I remember vaguely, yeah, I remember. I think I was born, I was in a, I think a place called England. I remember, and Sheffield, yeah, something like Sheffield, yeah, yeah, Sheffield. University, I don't know, did you, there was some, I don't know, I studied somewhere at Sheffield or somewhere, or something like that. And yeah, I think I got a degree, I think I became a doctor or something, I don't know, and then I got married, I had children, then I died, yeah, then I died. Yeah, yeah that happened to me uh, about 67 years. Imagine, compare 67 years to 600 million years and beyond. Compare it. This is what Allah is saying in this verse. When you go in the next life, this dunya is like a, not even a drop in an, in an ocean. It's less than a drop. This dunya is a, it's less than a drop in the greatest scheme of things. So, anyway, brothers and sisters, this is what this worldly life is about. It's just a game, it's, it's just stages, it's different levels that we just pass through rapidly at a very rapid and quick and fast pace. And before we know it, like the poet says, Hayatuka and Fasun to Addu Fakullama, Mada Minha Nafasun in Takasat Bihi Juzha. Your life is a combination of a few breaths. Our lives are a combination of a few breaths. Every time we breathe, we take a breath. A portion of the life has passed and gone. We'll never come back again. This is what this life is about. So the real life, when we go in the next life, this life will seem like, as I said, a dream. But Going back to what I was saying, we are, I am reminding you and myself, right? So we are reminding each other, we are being reminded. It's making us think, alhamdulillah, at least that's good. It, it's making, and I'm sure I can see that everybody is thinking about this, which is good, alhamdulillah, at least thank Allah that we're thinking about this. But we need constant reminders because the reason, or, or, or uh, like I said, because due to the fact that we, dunya is close, akhirah is the next life, this is tangible, we are living it right now. Like in a dream, the dream was all the, everything for us, but when you woke up in the morning, it's past. This dunya, right now, is everything for us. This is why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in one hadith, he said, أَكْثِرُوا ذِكْرَ هَذِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ هَذِمِ اللَّذَّاتِ Constantly, excessively remember the thing that breaks and cuts off all pleasurable things. The worst, or no, sorry, not the, you shouldn't use the word worst, the most scary or distasteful topic for people is death, even though it's inevitable. We don't even want to talk about it because we get scared thinking about it. It's, it's something we need to, this is why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned this, that constantly, Remember death. كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ Every soul shall taste death. And, uh, and then Allah mentions something else which I will mention. So, this is, when we go in the next slide, this is what will happen. And before that, this point, that because the human mind is limited, this is our nature, this is the way we have been created, this is the way we are born, that something 
which we don't see, it's not tangible, we can't take it seriously enough. Right now, this room is the most important thing for us. Because this is how the human mind works. Because Akhirah is not with us right now, our yaqeen and conviction sometimes becomes weak. If not, then at least our sort of dedication to it is not, it's not as it's supposed to be because it's not with us. The example of that is exactly, the example of that is similar to an unborn child. When a child is unborn in the stomach or in the womb of his mother, that child, after, like in the beginning, it's just like the Quran says, you know, it's a not fight, a drop of sperm, etc., the different stages. But then, in the hadith, the Messenger ﷺ mentions after three stages, life is, you know, placed into or blown into the fetus, and it becomes a living fetus in the, in the stomach of the mother. That unborn child, for that unborn child, what is dunya? For that unborn child, this small room, whatever that is, you know, the room is everything. If somebody wants to tell that unborn child, you know what? There's a city called Sheffield. <laughs> and there is, this is a bigger, this, this is a hospital first of all. Oh, this is, this is a room. After the room, there is a slightly some more rooms, and there's some wards, and then there's a bigger hospital, and then there's some streets, and there's a town center, then there's Sheffield, then there's a country, then there's a world, there's ocean, there's fishes, and you know, all sorts of creatures, and then there's space, and there's Jupiter, and there's Mars, and there's Venus, etc. Impossible. The child will just not understand, because it's not tangible. Very difficult. For that child, the whole world, for the child's world is a mother's womb and stomach. That's the world. This is a massive world. Wow. It's, it's so great, so huge. The latest technology is in this world. The latest technology is in this world. Amazingly, the child is nourishing. Nourishing. And Allah is nourishing the child in the stomach of the mother. When the child is born and comes out cryingly, yeah? came out involuntarily, we never chose to come out, but the child came out, Allah you know, created that child, the child is born. When that child is in that room, now the whole world is what? As big as this room. Right? You tell a small three, four month old baby that there is another room as well, and there's other, you know, there's a city, country, impossible. It's just not possible for that child's brain to grasp this fact like for example someone lives in a village yeah one of my teachers once said that he went to from one country to another country and in another country there was a relative and in a village really far away from the city area he went to see one of his relatives and there was an old lady uh, that came to she found out that he's come from this other country and from this city so she came so oh, you come from this country from this city oh do you, do you know my uh, nephew What's your nephew's name? Said, no, I don't know. How do you know him? You're from the same city. So this year I tried to explain to him that the city I come from is like a massive city, you know, it's like London, for example, and there's thousands of people, not every person knows. But she just couldn't understand the fact. She just thought it was very rude. How is it not possible? Because she lived in a village where there was 20 families. Every family knew everything about the other family. So this sheikh trying to explain to him, to her, this old lady, but it's not possible in my city because there's thousands of people, literally thousands. She just, till the end, she just wouldn't accept it. She just didn't get it because she has not come out from that village ever in her life. Those people who go for Hajj and Umrah sometimes from a village in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh or Somalia or whatever, and they've never left their street or alleyway or their village in their life. And then they go for Hajj and Umrah they get a massive shock. It's like, what is this? It's a massive shock that they, 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 they get. So, this is the same example, the child in the stomach, of a person 
who lives in this world but cannot think about the reality of the next life. Where like this dunya is like the mother's womb. <coughs> this world seems big. Being a doctor or a sheikh or whatever, any career is the pinnacle of any human being's success. Being a lawyer and a barrister and studying dentistry or whatever, being an astronomer, probably astronomers say, I've gone a bit far, you know, I've actually gone out of the world. Okay? But this just sounds like, it seems like everything. And this is what Allah is saying in these verses of the Quran. That this life is nothing but deception. However, the other aspect is life just a game. And before I mention that, just this, this verse came into my mind. Allah describes in the Quran in one of the places about Jannah paradise, that Jannah paradise is so huge and so vast that it's... Um, that heavens, the vastness of the smallest heaven, and there's some hadiths about this as well, about the vastness. It's as big as this, the, the, you know, the worldly, the heavens, the seven heavens. It's massive. Sometimes when we read these hadiths and some texts of the Quran, that it's huge, it's massive, very difficult to comprehend. Exactly in the same way the child to think about the world when the child is in the stomach of the mother. So, this life is nothing but a game. However, when we say this life is serious, it's not a game. That is also correct. That is also correct. But this is why I'm trying to connect the two. This life is only important. This life is only important when... We connect it to the next life. This life is an introduction to the next life. It's like the waiting room, so to speak. Like a waiting room, an introduction before the real eternal life. So when the eternal, real, next life is so important, when, when the actual thing is so important, the rehearsal or the introduction here, you have mock exam, yeah, the mock test is also somewhat important. But it's only important because of the importance of the of the next life. So this is life just a game? No, this life is not a game. We must take it seriously. But it's only the only reason why we must take it seriously, it's not important in of itself. It's not important to feed enough sihi, fi dhatihi in of itself. It's not important because of the life being important. Because of it. You understand what I'm trying to say? It's only important because of Akhirah. It's only important because of the next life. Had it not been connected, had this life not been an introduction or a means to have a blissful next life, then this life would just be a game. Nothing. Just be absolutely futile. But because it's an introduction to the next life. So when the next life is important, the introduction also becomes important to that extent. And this tells us something very important. That yes, we always talk about the serious, seriousness of this life. And this life is very serious, of course. Time is an asset that we must value. Every single minute and second that we possess is so significant, seriously. But this is the difference between a believer and someone who does not believe in the next life. Even those people who do not believe in the next life, don't believe in God, even they know and they realize that this life is important and time is very valuable and precious. Anyone who wants, who wants success in this life, any, look at any human being who has had some sort of success in this life, be it in politics or whatever, business, you will see that they have spent a life, unless nowadays, you know, nowadays, Make money just like that, you know, but, that, but that's not really success. Yeah, being a football player is not success. Earning two hundred thousand pounds a week. I mean, in, in the earlier times, sports was just something you did, you know, just to refresh yourself. Yeah, 
the serious part of your life, serious work, when you're really like tired, then you go and watch, refresh yourself. That's why there's a hadith, there's, the chain is not that uh, strong, but it's probably a statement of one of the Sahaba or one of the early Muslims. Every so often, relax yourself and you know, go and play something. Then you come back to your real focus. When you're so deep into your focus, you need a bit of now re re relaxation, go and have a game of football. Right? Or go and have a play, go and play the most boring game on planet Earth, which is cricket. But anyway, um, no boring, okay, I don't know how people play for four days and then still brain stop playing. <laughs> and it's still like, you know, draw, after four days people still draw, but anyway, we, we, we'll agree to disagree there. But anyway, play, play a game, or golf, I think golf is so boring, I don't know how people can play golf. Um, but that's what... Sports was considered as now. Sports, probably someone is doing a degree on David Beckham here. That's how, you know, do a degree, do a master's on David Beckham's toe. <laughs> or or, or he, has, you know, he's, he has some sort of, I don't know, tattoo or something, and he's like this. I mean, it's crazy. Before, success, even in the world, was measured with something important. You're giving something back to what? Humanity. You're providing services, medicine. This is why in Islam, actually, medicine is given a very important status. Imam al-Shafi'i radiallahu anhu, one of the great imams of this ummah, he actually used to say, al-ilmu ilman, ilmu fiqhi lil adhyan wa ilmu tibbi lil abdan. Sciences worth studying are really only two. Religious sciences, sacred knowledge, Islamic knowledge, and medicine. Because one caters for your body and one caters for your akhirah. And likewise, dentistry, similar because it's to do with the well-being and the health, oral health of the human being, and maybe pharmacy or whatever, or lawyer, uh, or, or law, or being a barrister, or whatever. These are important sciences. And success was only measured by those. And anyone who wanted success, even in monetary terms, you would only earn a good living if you actually did something like this. But now, you could be the most you know, dumb person on planet Earth. You don't have a brain at all. You just have a foot to kick a ball. And you're earning much more than even doctors and lawyers and professors and barristers. I mean, it's crazy. It's just crazy. Especially in, in football, as you know, there's 200,000 pounds. You know, I was talking to my father a few weeks ago, and I was just trying to tell him, I was saying, people earn 200,000 a week. He said, say that again. He thought like 200,000 over the whole life. 200,000 a week. So are these guys crazy? What happened to them? I mean, how can somebody even earn 200,000 pounds a week? It's just not even possible. I'm not discouraging anybody or I'm saying they're all doing haram, etc. There are a lot of Muslim uh, sports players actually. One football I recently met as well, a very good brother, mashallah, very good. But I don't want to talk about it too much. Um, because he, he told me not to talk about it too much. <laughs> he phoned me, I mean, I, I put something on the internet and then he texts me. He's a very famous footballer, he's crazy in the, the premiership. Uh, he's a Muslim, but mashallah, very practicing, very, very practicing. Five time prayers, he prays regularly in the masjids, he donated a lot of amounts to some charity projects. Um, and um, um, mashallah, very, very good brother. But he's very sincere. He's very sincere, and he really cares about the deen. And he actually asked me, he said, what would you advise? Would you advise young people to take a career in sports? And it was him asking me, what can I say? You know, because he's, he's a football player. I said to him, you know, I said, look, you know, generally I would say no, because, uh, you know, people can be washed away in that whole environment. But yes, if somebody is solid, very strong in their deen, and they have connection with deen, with knowledge, with, and they take this life, you know, seriously as an introduction to the next life and, and they are very serious about the deed and maybe so, not a problem. So anyway, um, this is what this life uh, is about. It's an introduction, like I was saying. Um, yeah, so I was saying that um, these games and sports, people earn money and success is measured by these things nowadays which were never considered to be success previously. But uh, something important which we give back to humanity. Um, I was saying something, but I've just forgotten. Did you remember what I was saying? Talking about your football, friend. No, no, before that, before all the football sports. 
No, before that. Yeah. Yeah. I was. I was. I'm just. Um, I was talking about how time is valuable, and. Uh, but anyway. Um, I was explaining this part that this is this life is only important. Yeah, out here. Now, uh, that those those people who believe, even those people who do not believe in the God, who don't believe in the importance of the next life, even they are of the opinion that if anyone wants to be successful, wants to make something out of his or her life, or if someone wants success then they must like you said value their time value their time and the life that they have and we look at any successful human being that's come on planet earth that's what i was saying that now success is through sports as well but true success someone who's done something good in their life they've actually valued their life everyone okay but the difference this is the point that i wanted to bring across the difference between a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, someone who believes in God, someone who believes in the next life, and difference between that person and difference between who does not, someone who does not believe in God, both know the importance of time, both realize that this life is precious, but the difference is what? The difference is major, massive difference. The difference is this one who does not believe in the next life, life after death, does not believe in God, does not believe in Akhirah. For that person, this life is important in of itself. Make the most out of it, this life. You're never, you're never going to live again. This is very important. Do something. Leave a legacy. When you die, you finish. That's it. End of story. So this life is important. Time is valuable. Life is an asset, time is an asset for that person as well. But in of itself, for a believer, for you guys here, most of you, I'm sure, uh, maybe some of our non Muslim friends here, but the ones who believe, yes, it's very important to be a doctor, to be a, bar a barrister, to study medicine, to study this, to career, jobs. All of this is important. But only, because sometimes we forget this, sometimes we start saying, yes, life is important, it's not just a game, it's very serious, make the most out of your life, you know, be very good students, do something for humanity. Of course, this is part of our deen, this is part of our teachings. But we sometimes forget and we start thinking, this, this is, in of itself, important. And that's why, if we consider this life to be important, in of itself, and our focus is only on this life and the focus turns away and shifts from the next life then we are in loss that's why brothers and sisters take this life seriously but always remember this life is only serious because of the next life always remember that never forget that this life is only important it's not just a game because of the next life and if we don't have that in mind about the next life, then this life in of itself is not important. It is a game. Then. It's just futile. It's just a joke and it's just fun and it's just a game. And this is why the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari, he said, Kun fi dunya ka gharibun aw aabiru sabeel. Be and remain and stay in this dunya like a gharib, stranger, a traveler. Then he said, no, but just a passerby. Stopped at the service station on M1. Did I start making a property there? No. Did I start, you know, think, thinking to myself that I'm going to stay here forever? No. It's just passing by. This dunya is just pass by. Not even like, not even gharib means that you're going somewhere for like two, three months. Or you've come to Sheffield from Manchester. He just told me it's from Manchester. So gharib is you've just come to Sheffield just to study. You're going to be here for two, three, four years. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, stay in this world, not be in this world like a traveler, stranger, then said no, but rather a passerby. This is actually even in the Bible. Sayyiduna Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him. 
He says, this world is like a bridge. Cross over it, don't build over it. This world is like a bridge. Just cross over it and don't build on it. Some of the early Muslims gave examples of the dunya. One of them gave an example of the dunya being like the toilet and the washroom and the bathroom in one's house. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah gave this example. He said, the dunya is like the toilet. When you buy a house property, do you always think about the toilet? As soon as you go inside your house, well, how's the toilet doing? Is it okay? Straight inside the house. Just quickly run to the toilet and check everything. No. But is toilet an important part of your house? Of course, it's an important part. It's important, it's needed, but it's like a need. Another, uh, one of the early scholars, I think it was Rumi who gave an example. He said, it's like uh, when a person is in the ship. A person is in the ship. And the water which is around the ship is very important. You can't live without the dunya. You can't live without having a career and a job and property and assets. You can't. The ship or the boat cannot move or function without water. But as long as the water is outside the ship, outside the boat, the moment the water starts coming inside, the boat drowns. The moment the water starts coming, the, the boat what? Drowns. The moment dunya starts coming into the heart, which means we start thinking it's important in of itself, this career and job is important in of itself, being a doctor is important in of itself, that's when our hearts drown. It becomes um, harmful. Worldly activities and wealth and goods and worldly aspects become harmful to us. In, in another hadith of Al-Bukhari, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, يَتْبَعُ الْمَيِّتَ ثَلَاثَ أَهْلُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعَمَلُهُ Any dead person that dies, three people follow him to the graveyard. أَهْلُهُ وَمَالُهُ وَعَمَلُهُ His family, his wealth, his family, so his sons, daughters, you know, people will come for the funeral prayer. Wealth as well, they'll be driving your car, my car, I'm in the coffin, and my car is being driven, right, to the funeral, to the graveyard, and وَعَمَلُهُ and his actions, his deeds. And then he says, فَيَرْجِعُوا إِثْنَانِ وَيَبْقَى عَمَلُهُ فَيَرْجِعُوا إِثْنَانِ وَيَبْقَى وَاحِدُ One stays with him, two things return. His family, no matter how close your family were with us, they're not going to stay there. They might stay, some of them might be a bit really depressed and just stay there and cry. Yeah? Maybe until Maghrib, Aisha, and they might hear a spooky voice. Ooh, they just run. What about your loved parent that you just buried? That's it. I can't stay here. So the family returns. Wealth returns. Only one thing comes with us in the grave. And he said, يَبْقَى مَعَهُ عَمَلُهُ The good deeds. Good deeds doesn't only mean offering prayer. Good deeds doesn't just, doesn't just refer to fasting or charity. Yes, it means prayer, it means uh, fasting, charity. But this is, this is my point now, that our deen and Islam is such a beautiful you know, way of life that Allah has given us, that even so-called worldly activities, so-called mundane, worldly, regular activities, such as sleeping, such as eating, such as drinking, such as conversing, such as talking, interacting, socializing, as long as we avoid sins, very important condition. As long as we avoid sins and we have the correct intention, studying, getting a career, job, all of this becomes righteous deeds. But the condition again is if we think this is an introduction to the next life. The focus is on the next life. Even studying at a university. This is why the first thing that everyone needs to do, if you haven't already done so, which is correcting of intention. The Sahih Niyyah. Every, more or less, many hadith books, they start with this particular hadith. The famous hadith, Imam al-Bukhari, who starts his book with this, his collection with this hadith. Famous hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِرْئِ مَّا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجَرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجَرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجَرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا أَوْ إِلَى دُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَتْ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجَرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَجَرَ لِهِ Actions are 
by the intentions. If you're studying, you have to change your intention. Why am I studying? Why are you studying? Why is a person studying? Why have you chosen to take a career in... What do you do? I don't know anything. You don't do anything? <laughs> Everyone does something, brother. Okay, let me ask you. Uh, what, what are you studying, brother? Engineering. Engineering. We need to ask ourselves a question. Why? Because remember, everything we do is not for its own sake, right? It's not for its own sake. It's all about the next life. So at even a job or a career you go into, you have to correct your intention. This is for the sake of Allah. I am doing engineering, so X, Y, Z, you know, I can do this, I can do this for humanity, I can serve people, I can do this, I can do that. I don't know what you do because I don't have a clue what you study, but whatever. If someone's a medic, you know, I want to serve humanity, whatever, whatever field you're in, Allah will reward you for that. Remember, Allah will reward you for that. And this is why then even studying becomes important. Having a career in medicine or engineering or law becomes important. It becomes rewarding. Why has it become important? Because you've connected it to the next life. If you disconnect it from the next life, then it's not important. It's not important. This is a message I want every one of you to take with you today. I haven't ended, by the way. But this, this is the message I really want you to take with you. That whatever you're doing, studying, or anything, business, or every part of our lives, connect it to the next life. Connect it to the Akhirah. So then this life and whatever we do, activities of this life, will also become an act of ibadah, an act of virtue, a righteous activity. An act of reward, something like this is this is our deen. It's so simple that actions are according to the intentions, even worldly activities. But two conditions: intention is changed in the mind, and number two, it's done in the right right way, correct way, avoiding sins. Time is flying, as you know, brothers and sisters. It's just so fast. This life, actually, one of the signs of the day of qiyamah. There's a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari where the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam he mentioned, he said he gave certain signs of. The final hour, and one of them he said, Yataqarabu Zaman. Time will fly. I mean, we always talk about it, I'm sure everybody knows. It was 2007, 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, like February, before you know it, June, July 14, 18, 19, 2033. Seriously, it's going to, I just can't, you know, sometimes when I think about this, remember where the last decade went. The millennium. Was just just like around the corner, three four years ago. I was just remembering the world was going to end after the millennium, and then 2004 definitely was going to end. And then just recently, when was it? 2012. Yeah, I was actually I was, I was in another country. I know, the brothers were telling me there that there, actually some people they made all these bunkers. <laughs> where was I? I'm forgetting where I was. Um, I think it was in Canada. Uh, they were saying that. Lots of people, they made all these bunkers underground because they really thought the world was going to die. And they waited inside under the bunkers. The world's going to die, but what, your bunker's going to stay? <laughs> With crazy logic. And then they were disappointed. And some of them spent like thousands, millions of pounds preparing for the past four or five years for the final hour. Like they made some super <laughs> solid proof, sound proof and what proof, I don't know. Bunkers underground. And then the world didn't end and then they popped out from, you know, like the bunkers and the world is still moving around. But this is what happened. Time is so quick and so fast. That's why life is not just a game. In, in itself it is, but because of the Akhir, it's not just a game. نِعْمَتَانِ مَغْبُونٌ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ As-sihhatu wal-faraq. The Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, two, this is a hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, there are two bounties, two gifts that every one of us, every human being receives. But most people are in deception regarding them. Number one is sihha, health and well-being. When we are healthy and when we are, we are uh, you know, we have well-being, we don't appreciate it. People are in deception. That we, we think we're going to be like this all the time because I'm running fast right now. Yeah, uh, 100 meters, uh, I can do it like very quickly. We're at that stage right now. We walk and run like, an, you know, someone running for the Olympics or something. 
So, but it's not always going to be like that. We will slow down. I'm sure. No? Anyone slowed down yet? No? I think that I'm slowing down. But we will slow down. And this health will no longer be like how we have health right now. And that's why the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, most people are in deception. They feel this health, they'll stay healthy like this all the time, all their life. And number one, farah, when you have time. Make the most out of health, well-being, and also the time that Allah has given us. Shaitan and Iblis, he, he deceives us. And he makes us think. And this is why Shaitan, one of the names of Iblis and Satan in the Quran, given is the one who deceives. Don't let the deceiver deceive you. And Shaitan deceives us by giving us messages. This world is long. Don't worry. You've got a long time. Death? You're not going to come now. That happens in, you know, death is like, don't you, how, it's not possible. And that's how, subhanAllah, all of us, we think like that. You know when someone dies? Subconsciously. I, I don't know about you guys, you guys, alhamdulillah, you're in a very high level of spirituality where you think about death much more. But I'm talking about myself. Even when someone dies, subconsciously think, that's him dead or she's passed away. Death can come, can't come to me, can come to her. Do just think to yourself for a moment. Do you know how much does every one of us we believe in the next two minutes we could die? Out of 100%. Really. In the next two minutes it's possible I could just go through. I could be giving a talk, you know, there's a YouTube clip of a sheikh uh, once delivering a khutbah and. Don't worry, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Let us ask ourselves the question. In two minutes, I could die. Some of us maybe 1%. Deep down. Some of us could be 5%, 10%, 15%. Some of us like 0%. No, not really. I mean, I know it's a distinct possibility. It's like one of those impossible kind of things which can happen like, you know, suddenly, you know, one of the miracles could happen, but it's not possible. So, this is why it's very important. Give me a note uh, Yeah, yeah, no problem, inshallah. No, I thought you were giving me five minutes or something. Okay, just five minutes and let me just wrap up, inshallah. So the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is what he is telling us about the uh, importance of, of this next life. Uh, there's another hadith which I just want to end with. Iqtanim uh, khamsan qabla khams. Appreciate five things before five things. Shababak qabla haramik. Your youth before your old age. Sihataka qabla maradik Your health before your uh, Your wealth No sorry Sihataka qabla sickness Wa ghinaka qabla faqrik You've got wealth right now Don't just squander it Before you get poor Wa faragh qabla shughlik And your time before you become busy And then as a summary he said Wa hayataka qabla mawtik Take Appreciate and take value Of this life Before death comes and if we look at the early Muslim scholars, I didn't want to talk about this topic. The second part, I didn't talk about it too much, because actually, a couple of months ago, I did a talk, uh, the second part, in one of the universities in London, about time and the precious uh, asset that we have. And I went through like, lots of examples of early Muslims, how they value time and every second. And that's actually on YouTube as well. So I just didn't want, I want to do a different talk for my own benefit. You know, so that's why I didn't focus on that second part too much. But everybody knows, we need to be serious in this, in this life. Don't waste time, the precious time that Allah has given us, and the health that Allah has given me and you. Don't waste it, don't squander it, don't waste it. The money, parents are spending money on us, studying. But every second is more valuable than gold and silver, like some of the scholars say. أَغْلَى مِنَ الذَّهَبِ وَالْفِضَّةِ they would spend one minute out of their time as though they are taking out a pound from their pocket. Yeah, you know, to give somebody a pound, not everybody's just going to leave a pound lying around and just throw it or whatever. Even taking a minute out of your precious time and giving it to someone, it's like you're giving a chunk of your wealth. You're giving something. Somebody wants 27 minutes and 30 seconds of your time, you think 27 minutes. Or is this job or this task or this activity really worth giving my 27 minutes and 30 seconds? Yes, then give your time. If not, then it's not 
you shouldn't be giving your time for that activity. Anything which is low, the Quran says, Successful believers are the ones who are uh, who concentrate in the prayers. And then he said, Those who turn away from futile activities. Law is a simple activity. And what is the definition of that? Law is everything and anything that has no worldly benefit, no next worldly benefit. A worldly benefit as well is because of the introduction to the next life. So no benefit. You know, just sometimes people just spend like four hours studying at university, but just Saturday night. Four hours, precious four hours. Five hours, late night, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4 a.m. Just sitting around and just shisha and that's it. And that's, I made the word of shisha um, Just And just sitting there and just wasting time. Human beings don't do that. Serious human beings don't do that. And the Muslims don't do that. And students definitely don't do that. So anyway, I'm going to end with this, inshallah. May Allah grant us the tawfiq and Amen. give us the understanding and make us realize Amen. the importance of this life because of the importance of the next life. May Allah enable us to, you know, deal with this life appropriately and, and you know, be serious in this life so that our next life is, you know, full of blessings and blissful, inshallah. We're end with this. Okay, so we're going to do the question and answer session, if that's okay with it. Yeah, it's a good session. Um, so we can, either you can write it down and pass it to the end of the, the, the row, and then someone can come and give it to the front. Uh, or you can just raise your hands. Okay, it's a bit... It's not pure intention. Sometimes we start an action, and we do it purely because of Allah, but then sometimes we start an action, and we do it purely because of Allah, but then somewhere down the line, we kind of reach a stab and we forget why we're doing it, and we watch from your intentions. So how would you advise that? No written questions? SubhanAllah. I'll answer your questions. Nobody has any written questions? No? Maybe you're going to ask too many. Last week we had a program somewhere and we had about 65 or 70 questions after the program. So those people didn't really know much. MashaAllah, here people are very, very knowledgeable. Um, yeah, this is a good question. Actually, people have asked this before as well. I remember, I think the same talk that I talked about intention somewhere. Uh, somebody asked this question. We all know that it's very important, intention is very important. But like with everything in terms of our deen, you can't be 100% all the time. It's impossible. Even the companions, you know the famous incident when one of the companions he came out of his house and he said, Hanbala radiallahu anhu. He said, Nafaqa Hanbala. He met Abu Bakr, Sayyidina Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He said, I've become a hypocrite. He said, why? He said, the way I feel when I'm with the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in the masjid, in the gathering, and when I come home, I don't feel the same level of spirituality. It's like, I'm a hypocrite. Abu Bakr said, man, I actually, same, I don't feel the same as well. I think I'm a hypocrite as well then. So they both went to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa And the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa consoled them and said, look, you know, this, these are stages of human beings. You know, you don't, you're not going to be at the same stage or level all the time. So likewise, exactly, as long as you are concerned in the heart, there are some people who just don't care about the intention. The intention is totally and wholly incorrect, right? That's where it's scary and it's problematic and we need to be you know, wary of. But if somebody, he constantly, constantly evaluates the intention and they think about the intention, they want to please Allah, one day they, they might be like 100% fully sincere, the next day it goes back to 90, not a problem, nothing to worry about. That's like in Salah as well. Sometimes you have full khushu, khudu, when you're reading Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Malik, and then Iyak and Abdu, Iyak and Sta'in, you start thinking about, you know, engineering, and then in the Salat al mustaqim you're thinking about the kebabs you had yesterday, and then, غير المغضوب, I'm offering Salah, غير المغضوب, ayah, غير المغضوب, don't say stuff for Allah, but anyway, غير المغضوب, you come back to focus, not a problem, as long as you're not doing it intentionally. Well, inshallah, Allah, Imam al-Dhahabi, actually, one of the great muhaddith and imams of the Sunnah, uh, he's actually written about this in one of his books. He was talking about sacred knowledge, but he said that um, if some people have a mixture of intentions, he said, look, تَصْحِيْحُ النِّيَّةِ مِنْ طَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ وَاجِبٌ That's in his book, al muqida uh, He said it's necessary for every student to have correct intention. And then he goes on to explain, he says that if the intention is a mixture 
of the sincere correct intention and the insincere uh, incorrect intention. فَالْعِبْرَةُ لِلْغَالِبِ Those are his words. He said, consideration will be taken of the predominant, predominant intention. So if you're 55 sincere and 45 insincere, then and you 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 know pass away on that stage or you know consideration will be taken of the majority. And then he goes on to say that actually it is uh, rare that a person who constantly keeps on evaluating that that 65 percent will not increase, 55 percent will not increase. Eventually you will get to a level 80, 90, at least 90 percent where you will become sort of very very sincere. Because in the beginning it's you start off with insincere. That's why they say children, you know, children. Children, you can be insincere. You know, we have children. Make them offer salah. Show off, not a problem. Yeah, you have a seven year old child, ten year old child. It's all about showing off, not a problem. Yeah, I just took, you know, when I was a young kid, I used to do lectures when I was about 10, 12. My father used to make me do talks. You know, like we have these masjid, madrasa gatherings, you know, kids, you know what I'm saying? Kids' uh, gatherings. So I used to be about 12, 13. I used to like doing that. I used to do a lot of nasheed as well. Actually, when I was a kid, I used to read a lot of nasheed. But it was all show off. I'm still show off. But um, that time, it was more of a show off. Nothing. You, you don't even think about intention. It's like, yeah, everybody's going to say, wow, mashallah. Say, oh, you, read, you did a really good qara'ah of the Quran. You recited some good Quran. You've got a beautiful voice. We're more concerned about reading like Shaykh Abdurrahman as Sudais or someone other than, rather than Tajweed. Who cares? We want to just copy. I used to copy every single Imam that is there on planet when I was about 10, 12 years old. I actually still have a recording where I used to do the Surah Al-Fatiha and every ayah I used to change as another Imam. I used to do that when I was a kid. Kids do that, not grown-ups. But anyway. It's on um, YouTube. It's on YouTube. <laughs> there was no YouTube that time. <laughs> so, when I was like, this was when I was about 10. But it was all showing off. And that's why our teachers, parents, sheikhs, and people tell us, when you're young, it starts off, it starts off with showing off. You have to start off at a stage where you're just showing off. Don't worry. Don't stop saying, I'm not going to study because I, my intention is so bad. That's shaitan again coming. You want to start memorizing the Quran? Oh, people will think, you're a bilqari, you're a hafid of the Quran, that stuff, that's not me. No, no, no. Don't stop. That's shaitan. And finally on this point, one of, one, of the, one of my teachers once said, don't do anything for other than Allah and don't leave anything for other than Allah. Don't do anything for other than Allah and don't leave. If you are doing something good, don't say, oh, people will call me big sheikh or big pious, you know, big this, that. Don't leave anything for other than Allah. Do it for Allah. If you don't want to do it because of some other reason, then don't do it. But don't never leave a good deed for other than Allah as well. Thank you. Next question. Yes. Um, just a quick question on time. Um, you know, life is generally quite busy for most people. That's what we say anyway. Um, but how do we, how do we allocate slots? I mean, you've got the Maaz, you've got the Quran. You get, you get the, you get the more, you get the five times slot. That's a fixed slot near enough. How can you, and what sort of advice can you give for fixed slots for other things? Besides from work and children, parents, and family, and friends, and advice on how to fix slots. Just to like do some extra pieces, routines. Okay. First thing to keep in mind is that even things that you're doing besides those extra things can also be acts of ibadah. Spending time with the family. It's probably one of the greatest acts of ibadah that you can do. So we shouldn't distinguish, as a believer, between those acts of ibadah and the other ones. It's wrong to think dhikr is an act of ibadah, but sitting with my husband and wife, not my husband and wife, <laughs> more than my husband, husband or wife, or children, or parents, or siblings, that's somehow dunya stuff. You make your intention correct. You say, I want to uh, fulfill the rights of those people whom Allah has enjoined upon me to fulfill their rights. And that becomes an act of ibadah. This is why sometimes, this is a point, side point, sometimes some people, when they get engrossed in deen, they feel that unless you don't sacrifice, yeah, and this is a grave mistake some people make, 
they get involved in some sort of you know really deep religious type of you know activity, and then they start feeling that even spending time with my wife or my husband or my children is like worldly thing. No, I don't have time for all this dunya stuff. Since when did this become dunya? I mean, that's a really wrong understanding. So this is why you need to understand that. Look, those. That's the first point. That consider even the other things to be act of ibadah. And then number two, other things like you want to do dhikr. Dhikr is what? Dhikr means remembrance of Allah. Everything is dhikr. What we're doing right now is also dhikr. Dhikr is anything that reminds you of Allah. Salah is dhikr. Okay? There are specific forms of dhikr, different types of dhikr, saying Allah, 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 Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allah, Akbar, Astaghfirullah. All of this is dhikr. Sadaqah. You say, okay, I want to do some sadaqah. You know what the hadith says? Hadith says even having sexual relations with your husband or wife or wife um, is an act of sadaqah. Imagine. Wafi budi ahadikum sadaqa. That's good, he said Wafi ahadikum sadaqa. One of you fulfilling your sexual needs is an act of sadaqa. In another hadith says, uh, Shall I not inform you ala ukhbirukum bi afdala min darajati sa'im al qa'im? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Shall I not inform you of something more rewarding than what? Praying at night all day long, all night long and fasting all day long? The companion said, Bala ya Rasulullah, yes, O Messenger of Allah. He said, Islahu dhatil bayn. Reconciling between two people who are enemies of one another. You find two brothers who don't talk to one another. They've been enemies. You go and reconcile between them two, and you bring the enmity to an end, more rewarding than nafil prayer all night long, tahajjud and qiyamul layl, and fasting voluntary fasts for days on end. So there's different ways. We have so many different ways. Uh, so in terms of, you know, that's, keep that in mind. But then yes, of course, everyone should have a timetable. Successful life is based on timetable. This is the time. Make it less, make it something that's manageable, achievable. Don't overwhelm yourself because the first step of falling down is to overwhelm yourself. People say, okay, I'm going to read 10 ajza and parts of the Quran, and then what happens? By the end of it, they don't read nothing. Small. Khayrul amali ilallahi adwamuha wa inqalna hadith. The best of actions, less but continuous. So make a timetable, do what you can do. Feel good about yourself. Don't feel bad that look, I'm you know, spending time with the family or I'm doing some work activities. This is make it just change your intention. Allah will reward you for studying for everything. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, mufti, so this is not directly related to the subject, but when did you receive your mufti status? So. <laughs> just briefly. <laughs> I, I don't give myself that status. So. The one who gave it to me, you could ask him. Sure. Can we keep the next uh, question relevant to the talk, please? Any other questions? Anything written down past the end? You Good. can write it and send it as well. If somebody just want to speak up, um, you guys to speak, then just write it to each other. Good. Um, like you said, certain activities that people partake in life. A few times. If someone has such a bad habit where he's spending time doing something he knows he shouldn't be doing, what advice could you give for him to stop doing that? Stop it. Find it difficult. There's only one thing I can say. You see, these kind of questions are It's a good question, and these questions are asked a lot. And I always say, there is no magic potion. There is no miracle. So there is no magic dua and there is no magic formula, right? Lots of people, even on the phone call, just today I had a sister, a lady, an older lady, uh, called me from up north somewhere here, just today in the afternoon, and she was talking about uh, her son, her son's married and, and wants to divorce his wife because he doesn't like her and he's got another girlfriend. Anyway, it's a big case, and I spoke to them like last week, both mother and son. But anyway, she said, I have no peace in my life. She's speaking to me in Urdu, and uh, half Punjabi, half Urdu. I, mean, I don't speak Punjabi, I understand it. Um, I can speak half of it. Um, so anyway, uh, she kept on saying, but I have no peace in my life, and this and that, etc., etc. Um, can you tell me something to read, and you know, just give me peace? 
this is a, such a common question. Can you give me something to read? I have nothing to give you to read. I want to tell you, I have nothing. There's no such a thing. I just give you, read it. You, we talked about this. I think one of my talks last year or something was about ruqya and ta'weez and, and ambulance and dua. Dua to Allah in your own words. Offer your five time prayers. You can talk to Allah in Chinese or in Somalian or in Arabic, whatever. From the heart, yes, Allah. you make dua to Allah and Allah will accept it. So to answer this and these type of questions, what advice can you give to someone? Like somebody asked me recently, somebody's sin, not you're saying useful, the useless activity. Somebody says, I'm involved in sin. What advice would you give to come out from that sin? There is no magic potion or formula or anything like that. The only thing that we have is willpower. That's it. Himma. Willpower. You want to do it? Where there is a will, there is a way. Where there's no will, there's no way. That's it. There's nothing else. You just have to have the willpower. I want to do it, I want to do it. You want to, lots of things we can do because we take an important note like in the morning, if you have to, if someone says in the morning, 5.30 a.m., you better wake up and, you know, there is 100,000 pounds on offer. If you wake up 5.30, 5.30 and you go somewhere 6, 6 o'clock, you will get 100,000 pounds. You don't even need an alarm clock. We don't even need an alarm clock. No alarm clocks. Automatically, we'll, we'll, we won't even sleep. We'll wake at 4 o'clock, 4.01, 4 okay. 4.30, 4.20, 4.45. Fajr, we have three alarm clocks and we come in. So it's, this is, this is, it's in our mind. We just need to change our minds. Right. Any other questions? Okay, uh, I've got one on my What can we do to help us zoom out? and put things into perspective. Elaborate on your question. Okay, so um, you mentioned that uh, as you go through the stages of life, you have different um, things that are really important. But how can, because as we're traveling through life, uh, how can we keep uh, remembering the, the overall goal? Um, is there anything we can do? The overall go goal that I talked about in the talk? Mm -hmm. Like I said, that it's not something that we should just constantly be sad and gloomy about. That's another extreme. It's not something we should be sad and gloomy about every single hour, second, we think about death and that's it, and we're going to die in a moment. Otherwise, we can't live in this world. We can't live, we can't do anything if we think like that. So with a bit of balance, this is what we need to do. Now, every so often, frequently, every so often, um, we uh, reflect about the temporary nature of life. Read about death. There are books written on death, many books. Read about them. Read the Quranic verses, the hadiths that talk about uh, death and the real life and the eternal life and the next life. Uh, and I think just keep constant reminders every so often, inshallah, because this is what the Quran says. وذكر. Remind because reminder always helps. This was just a reminder. How many of you may have known 80, 90, or even 100% of what I said? Right? But it's just a reminder. We don't always come to talks or lectures just to learn something new. Yes, a lot of the times we do. But many of the times it's a reminder because it helps. The Quran says it benefits the believers. So constant reminders like that to keep on thinking about the bigger picture the greater picture, which is the Akhirah. But at the same time, you know, give importance to the current uh, situation or condition that you are in, inshallah. Okay, last chance. Any other questions? Do you want to okay. One more? I'm sure somebody has. <laughs> somebody can ask one non-related one. If, come on, I'll, I'll, I'll do some sadaqah. One, one non-related one if you want. But non controversial at the same time. You can't give us the name of that brother who plays for that premiership. What's the team that he plays for? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for asking. I think some people know because I put it on social, you know, I think somewhere on the internet. So. What is this year?